All right. Hey, it is that time, Wednesday, June 30th. <clears throat> time for another uh, episode of Coffee and Chat. Um, I posted on our Facebook page, uh, but I will remind you here in case you're just logging on uh, to gather communion elements because we're going to be doing communion at the end tonight because um, it goes along with what we're talking about. So uh, I want to give you a moment or two for you to go into your kitchen and grab some uh, some bread, some juice, uh, and and have that available. We'll be doing communion um, at the end uh, of tonight's uh, tonight's episode. Well, it, it uh, it's the night of the Passover celebration, and put yourself in in the disciples' shoes. You um, you don't realize that this will be the last meal that you'll eat with Jesus. You're one of Jesus' disciples, and you walk into the to the room, and you expect someone to wash your feet. You see uh, water, a towel, but there's no servant to wash your feet. Well, what do you do? Do you wash your dirty feet or just shake your head at the poor hospitality and sit down? Knowing that when you sit down, your feet and everyone's dirty feet will be close to the food. Foot washing was a common practice, but there were no servants there. So each disciple does the same thing. They all file in and recline at the tables, making themselves comfortable as they stick their dirty feet in each other's faces. They're ready to celebrate the Passover, and Jesus takes his place at the center of the table. And suddenly, he gets up. He walks over to the water basin. He takes off his outer garment. He looks at the disciples who are waiting to be served, and they just stare back at Jesus. You wonder what Jesus was thinking in that moment. Was he thinking, Father, th this is unbelievable. Don't they get it? I have talked with them until I'm blue in the face. What more do I need to do? Sermon after sermon, illustration after illustration, confrontation after confrontation, miracle after miracle, and they still don't get it. So Jesus picked up the servant's towel. He poured water into the basin and he went to each disciple and kneeled as he washed their dirty, smelly feet. After washing their feet, including Judas's, remember, Jesus returns to the table and here's what he said. He said, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. See, friends, the call from Jesus to the disciples and really to each of us is to become a servant. And if we were really to speak the truth about serving, let's be honest, many of us aren't really thrilled with the prospect of becoming a servant. Because, see, the call of Jesus is not just to serve, but to become a servant. In his book, Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster wrote this. He said, in some ways, we would prefer to hear Jesus' call to deny father and mother, houses and land for the sake of the gospel, than for his word to wash feet. Radical self-denial gives the feel of adventure. If we forsake all, we even have the chance of glorious martyrdom. But in service... We must experience the many little deaths of going beyond ourselves. Service banishes us to the mundane, the ordinary, and the trivial. Now, friends, those are tough words. Words which step on our toes. 
And when we think about it, there are many who just don't like to serve. And there's a myriad of reasons why. We think people will take advantage of us. Uh, We complain, why aren't uh, other people serving along with me? We wonder if anyone will see me serve so that they'll think more of me. We may think that the work is beneath us. We, uh, We judge harshly those we're supposed to serve. Some of us, we just don't have the love within us. Uh, we just refuse to do it. Some of us say, oh, we just don't have the time. And I mean, let, let's be honest. Serving comes in all different shapes and sizes and at all different places and times in our lives. I like what John Ortberg said in his book, The Life You've Always Wanted, when he spoke about serving taking place at home. He explained when the baby cries in the middle of the night, he could fake being asleep. And then as his wife is leaving the room, say a few words in a kind of groggy voice as if he would have gotten up to take care of the child, but he's just a heavy sleeper. This way he gets credit for for wanting to help, but being just a little late, and he gets the extra luxury of staying in bed and falling back to sleep. But what would happen if he just got out of bed and groggily but joyfully went over to the child and took care of the crying child? He could be a blessing. Now, some may say it's a matter of perspective. I would say it's a matter of the heart, the heart of a servant. When a loved one is sick, we don't often consider the toil that it'll take on us. Instead, we we willingly and lovingly care for our loved one. We don't view it as a service. We don't call ourselves a servant. We do it because of love. There are times that we take in a a parent or a child who's met up with some difficult time in life, and we know it's right to take care of them into our home and care and love them. You're being a servant, but you don't see it as a spiritual discipline. In fact, it's just a natural event in your life, and you don't think twice about doing it. I want you to look again at the words of Jesus after washing the disciples' feet. Verse 14, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, You also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I have to understand that it was unheard of for a person of Jesus' stature to wash someone else's feet. But Jesus didn't do the conventional. He didn't always follow the ways of the law. He followed the ways of love. It was love that motivated motivated Jesus to wash the disciples' feet. It was his desire to show the disciples what type of life the Christ follower must lead, a life of humility and servanthood. Jesus repeatedly told the disciples that we were to be servants, but they just didn't get it. And being honest, sometimes we don't either. In Luke chapter 22, verse 24, after... After the foot washing and after the dinner, the disciples were arguing over who was the greatest. Now, do you get this? They just had one of the most amazing gifts given to them, and it still didn't compute. That's why Jesus repeated himself so many times. He tells us again and again, we are to be servants, humble servants, Paul follows up on humility as he wrote the great uh, hymn in Philippians chapter 2. Paul describes Jesus' humility when he calls us to follow Jesus' example, saying in verse 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Verse 7, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. This is a great prescription for being a servant. Now consider what Paul says, if we could bullet point these. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Friends, it's not about you. Do nothing out of vain conceit. In other words, put away pride, put away arrogance. Instead, in humility, 
Consider others better than yourself. Look out for yourself, that's okay, but also look out for others. Your, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus. Make yourself nothing and take the nature of a servant. That, my friends, that's the call to servanthood. But, but understand that being a servant is different than serving. Richard Foster explains when we serve, we, uh, we still have control. We still have the choice about what we will or won't do. We decide whom we will serve and when we will serve, if it fits our schedule or not, if it's convenient or not. But when we choose to be a servant, we give up the right to be in charge. And when we do this, we find that there is great freedom in this. You see, if we voluntarily choose to be a servant, and even to be taken advantage of, something we fight against, then interestingly enough, we can no longer be manipulated. I know it's, it's pretty radical. If we choose to be a servant and give up our rights, then who can step, then somebody can step all over us. Well, in essence, nobody. When we choose to be a servant, we surrender the right to decide who and when we will serve. We become vulnerable. We become available. Who can hurt someone who has chosen to be stepped on? It's a different way of thinking about servanthood. When we combine service with our spiritual gifts, then we find greater fulfillment in serving others. Friends, spiritual gifts do us no good if we keep them hidden. The very purpose of receiving spiritual gifts is to use them for the glory of God as we serve Him. Peter said we are commanded to serve. Listen to what Peter wrote. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another, here's the key, without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Verse 11, if anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. See, if anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides so that in all things, in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Now, isn't that great? Love covers a multitude of sins. So love one another deeply. No, we all mess up. But when, in our, when our love is deep, when repentance and grace will be just as deep, friends, that's a gift from God. So take your spiritual gifts and use them. Use them at home, in the church, at work, in the community. Use them as a way to serve God. These gifts were given to us. Really, they were, they were entrusted to us to build the kingdom of Jesus on earth. Now, I've done a lot of talking about spiritual discipline. And I want to conclude by giving us some practical ways that we can put servanthood into action. What's the most basic way to serve? Psalm chapter 100 verse 2 tells us, serve the Lord with gladness. See, we're not to, not to serve begrudgingly, but joyfully and willingly. When we know someone has a need, we, we help in whatever ways we can. When I'm doing premarital counseling, one of the things that I always tell couples is, is that their goal in marriage is to outserve the other person. Can you imagine arguing about who's going to have the joy of washing the dishes or changing the diapers or taking out the trash? Do it with a smile. On top, top of that, we can look beyond the walls of our homes and into the church. Who in the church has a need in which you can provide some type of service? Maybe there's a family who needs child care for an evening, or maybe it's a neighbor who learns about Christ because you served them. Is there a family who needs a meal because of difficult times? Does someone need a ride? Maybe there's a need to clean someone's home. I mean, none of it is glamorous, but it is necessary. As I said, we often resist the hidden and uh, inconspicuous jobs. 
which is exactly why we need the spiritual discipline of servanthood. There are a multitude of opportunities available within our church. And we've been talking about this on Sunday morning. We're looking uh, at relaunching uh, and restarting, reimagining some some ministries. And we need need help. We need people willing to step up to the plate. And those needs are met when you use your spiritual gifts in the act of being a servant. In Mark chapter 10, verses 42 and 45, we read this. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Friends, Jesus calls us to a life of servanthood. It's a life where we practice a term which has become popular in leadership uh, literature. It's called servant leadership. One book that I have is titled, They Smell Like Sheep, meaning the leadership is not separate from the people of the church. Instead, they are part of the body. And because you work with people and you're not in a separate class, you all smell the same because you're working together. So greatness becomes radically redefined. Because if we want to be great in the kingdom of God, we must first become a servant, to have that servant mentality. Verse 45 is a sobering statement from Jesus. He makes two very important points for us to hold on to. First, Jesus reminds us that he did not come to sit on his throne, which as a king he was entitled to. Instead, he took off the royal crown, put the royal scepter down, and he joined the people, and he lived with the people, and in essence, smelled like the sheep. Secondly, and what we must recognize, as the ultimate example of servanthood comes in this final part of the verse when Jesus explained he not only came to serve, but his greatest act of servanthood comes in giving his life as a ransom for you and I. His death on the cross is the ultimate gift Of servanthood. Our call is to serve God, not out of guilt, but out of joyful obedience to the one who gave his life for us. As we serve God, we serve one another. We do this because of our faithfulness to God. We serve not to receive any type of gain, rather, we serve with humility because it leads to Christ's likeness. Love for others starts with a love for God. And when we discover that God loves us with the most powerful and amazing love and that He died for us and He adopted us as His kids, we want to obey Him. And He calls us to love one another. After washing the disciples' feet, Jesus said, A new command I give you, love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, friends, those are our marching orders. Love one another just as Jesus loves you. How can you and I be like Jesus? How can we have the right motivation? Well, be humble. Don't consider yourself better than others. Serve because God served you first. Serve because of His love for you. I want to pray for us, and then we're going to transition into communion. Lord, I thank you for the servant-hearted people who call First Church of the Nazarene their home. I'm reminded of a spiritual gifts test that I gave a couple years ago and how 70% of those who took the test, service was at the top. Father, you have gifted our church with men and women who care deeply about you, who care deeply about one another. Father, I would pray that you would just continue to fan the flame of servanthood in us and through us. 
Help us so that people will know you because of how we treat, respect, and love and serve others. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would prepare our hearts now as we transition to communion. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, after Jesus finished washing all of the disciples' feet, he put away the towel, put on the robe, and returned to the table. Then he took a piece of bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. If you have your bread, let's take it. Next, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you. Let's drink. One more act of service would follow. The ultimate act of service. The giving of his life. You see, as Jesus poured water into the basin to wash the disciples' dirty feet to show what a servant looked like, he would then pour out his blood on the cross to wash our dirty hearts. My brothers and sisters, that was the ultimate sacrifice. I pray this week that the Lord would give you opportunities to serve Serve in your home, serve in the church, serve in the community. I pray that the Lord would have intersections of people that He needs for you to have an opportunity to practice servanthood on. I'm praying for you. I hope you'll pray for me. Let's finish out the week strong, and I will see you on Sunday. God bless.